Hey y'all, what's up? My name is Jess. Welcome back to my garden here at Roots and Refuge Farm. Every Saturday I post tours of my garden throughout the entire growing season. I'm gardening here in Central Arkansas, zone 7B, 7A, kind of on the line between that one. Growing with all natural growing practices, growing a very large amount of our family's food. And I started doing these tours a couple of years ago and just learned how valuable it was to you, how valuable it was for me, for my own record keeping. My goal here is to just show you how things grow, share my experience with you so you can maybe skip over some of that hard-earned hands-on experience and, and benefit a little bit in your own garden. Now today we have some weather coming in. It's supposed to start raining at some point, so hopefully we can get through this whole tour. I have been wanting to do a tour a little differently. I haven't done one like this this year. And basically what I wanna do is go through and just tell you absolutely everything that's growing in my food gardens. Um, I'll, we'll take a quick, quick look at the cottage garden, but today I wanna get through all the varieties that are currently growing here in the food garden. I've got my harvesting basket in case we come across anything that just really needs to be picked, which we probably will because it's that time of year. But let's just go ahead and jump in. I did a pretty quick makeover on my chalkboard since I know the rain's coming, it's just gonna wash it away anyway set that down here. So the cottage garden over here is very much the same. Uh, things are still just really getting established. Oh, look at the limelight hydrangeas. Aren't those lovely? We've been harvesting just a handful of berries. Not a whole lot. I wasn't expecting a ton this year, but these are prima cane plants, which means they're putting off uh, canes and berries in their first year. I think this might be my favorite thing going on out here right now. The gladiolas are starting to open up. And the Dara carrots are going to be opening up. Now these blossoms are really, really pretty. Um, if you've ever seen Queen Anne's lace growing like wild on the roadsides, it grows wild here where I live. And Queen Anne's lace is a variety of wild carrot. So the Dara, it's just a very similar flower to that. So I showed you guys how I was kind of dealing with some browning in my uh, green stalk beans. And it was just because we had gotten so much rain and they were struggling. But I ended up putting a little bit of fertilizer in their water the next time that I watered them and tearing back anything that looks dead. And they're looking way better now. Today I really want to focus on our uh, food gardens though. That's where I want to spend most of the time of this tour. So there are a handful of things in here that are long past needing to be harvested. We are currently have been remodeling our kitchen. Terrible time of year for it really, but it is what it is. So I've got some things like some carrots and some beets that I hope that they're still worth something. These are called noodle beans. I've got two trellises with these on them. They're an Asian long bean, very tasty stir fried and very, very prolific. Also quite lovely growing on a trellis. So I've got these sunflowers just all around the garden from Hudson Valley Seed Company. Here I have a lettuce that is going to seed. This was a variety that actually grew in a like salad baby green mix, which I grew in a soil bag in my greenhouse over the winter. And then in the spring, I took one of the little plants out because I really liked it and grew it in the garden bed and harvested quite a few salads off of the plant. And I liked it so much, I just wanted to save the seeds for it. So obviously it's big and flowery now. And before too long, those flower pods will be all dried up and I'll be able to get the seeds out. I'll make sure I show you guys whenever it comes down to that. Now these beans are starting to climb, these purple potted pole beans and rattlesnake pole beans. Here I've got Zloty Lan chamomile. That's the variety of chamomile that I grew this year and it is doing very well everywhere I've put it. These are Texas Hill Country okra, looking beautiful as usual. I love okra blossoms. Okra is in the hibiscus family and you really see that in the flowers. Uh, they're both okra and hibiscus related to uh, marshmallow and then there's roselle or rosella which is grown for tea all related okra is really good for your digestion but because it has that mucilage it's you know the thing that people who hate okra hate about it the sliminess of it but it is very good for your gut and being a rel relative of marshmallow that's not surprising because, uh, marshmallow 
marshmallow root as one of the things that you use for stomach upset. So here I have silver slicer cucumbers and they're kind of trying to get away from the trellis here. Holding on to that bean trellis. Anytime you're growing something on a trellis, sometimes you have to gently remind it where it needs to stay. So we're definitely in the overwhelming cucumber time of year. I really like the silver slicer because even when it gets big like this, um, it's great. So it's great as a slicer at this size and great as a pickling cucumber at the smaller size. So I've been picking them at both and they stay pretty sweet at both sizes. Over here, also silver slicer. See there? But what's happening here is I've got like an Armenian long cucumber on the other trellis and they're sort of uh, cohabitating between these two. <laughs> and it's too much of a tangled mess for me to try to do anything about at this point. Down here are some volunteer melons. Um, I, was just, I really wanted these to grow and I was nervous that they would shock if I moved them because they were already pretty established when I found them. So I just left them here and I'm going to let them grow up this trellis. It's going to have beans on either side of it. Um, here we have a trellis that's not planted yet. And over here, this big blank space is where I pulled out my onions and garlic uh, last week. So I've got all this space to fill. Here I have some chives. Uh, this plant is a little over two years old. I put it in as a start that I'd started from seed last, no, spring two years ago. So it's a little over two years old. Very established and looking good. That provides a lot of chives for us. Right here is a melon called Delice Stella Table. Um, which I have learned from you guys means the table's delight. These seeds are from MI Gardener and I grew this because it's just a really unusual melon. I don't have any really developing yet. They're all still tiny little fuzzy babies. This is only two plants and they are really really taking over the space. So I hope they're not too crowded here. On this side I have just struggled getting these to grow some chickens got in my garden and scratched a bunch of stuff up. I actually have a couple of little babies right here uh, and they're freshly mulched so hopefully they'll do okay. In this bed I have banana plants which in my zone outdoors like this these are not going to be able to produce bananas. I actually don't know the variety. These were given to me by a friend of my mom's. Uh, actually just a couple little plants and they have reproduced quite a lot. I'd like to move some of these and repot them. But the benefit of growing these, other than the fact that they're just really lovely, a nice piece that sort of anchors the back side of the garden, is that the leaves are a great tool for cooking. You can wrap uh, meats and vegetables in them to smoke or grill and they just really help everything stay moist so that's kind of the reason why I grow them other than the fact that they're just really pretty. Here I have a Thai basil as well as a sweet basil. That sweet basil is really persistently trying to go to seed. I keep pruning it back and it just keeps flowering. What I will probably do about that is some point this week I will probably come and harvest this down really low. Just harvest most of these plants and puree them into some oil and uh, try to save them that way. Maybe just hang them up to dehydrate in the windowsill or something like that. I don't know. I'll just harvest them a lot so that that plant will kind of restart a little bit. Here are some yellow canary zinnias. Now these seeds were actually sent to me by a viewer. And so these really huge zinnias, I'm not exactly sure where you get the seeds for these, but they're really pretty. Along this row here, I have leeks, which are very much ready for harvesting. And here, if I can keep them from being overtaken by the Armenian white, a uh, couple of hot banana peppers here. And they're looking pretty good, probably getting pretty close to harvestable. There's one. No cucumber. I planted most of my peppers in my high tunnel this year, but I put some plants out in the garden just to see how they would do, and these are doing really well. So there's this massive Armenian white plant, and it's hardly producing or setting any fruit yet, but there's a tiny little baby, so I'll be harvesting these this week, I'm sure. Here in the midst of the Armenian white jungle is a little purple basil, and here's more blank space to fill. 
Hello, Ben. <laughs> My little garden boy. Here I've got a blue dwarf corn. It's like a blue sweet corn that only grows four feet tall. It's only been in here for a few weeks, so it's looking really good. On this trellis, these are my Kajari melons. Um, now they're slow getting started. My chicken scratched them up twice. Yum. Yummy, you see that harvest? Hey, there are some leek blossoms coming up. You wanna go pull them off? Thank you. I have a couple of cabbages remaining out here and they really need to, to go in and uh, get used because they're starting to just really get some damage as well as these beets, which are huge at this point. I'm just planning on dehydrating them. We have been using some of the greens, but they're just growing back really fast. This is a really, um, really old time plant that's been growing in my garden for years now. And I cut half of it off this year and it hasn't fully recovered yet. You can see there's some new growth there and uh, some older growth, but that'll look pretty again by next year. Here are some nasturtiums that have really run their course. Nasturtiums don't love the heat. Now one green that actually handles the heat really well is chard, and this is a like a silver beet chard. It was actually a part of a rainbow mix, but some of the rainbow ones, the pink ones and stuff, they just, they, when I transplanted them, they never really took off, but the silver ones did fantastic. Chard's flavor does change some when it starts getting hot. It does start getting a lot earthier, but it's a really great option to grow something leafy. It's if you live in a climate that's warm. Here are the vestiges of my kale bed, which some of them are definitely doing better than others. Uh, we struggle with pests a lot this time of year with kale. A lot of times it'll go ahead and start to flower. But I've got a variety here, like a scarlet kale, um, like a just a blue curly kale. This is the thousand head, really tall, big kale. There's another blue curly. I feel like this is probably the hardiest of the plants as far as like being heat tolerant is that blue curly. And the dinosaur kale does pretty well too. Also have kaolettes here and I'm just gonna show you this just happened like overnight. Do y'all see all those worms? So I can put some BT on this and probably handle those worms, but unfortunately this is kind of the story of how it goes once we start getting into the summer with brassicas. Those are collards right there that are pretty ate up as well. Most likely what I'll actually do with this bed is uh, probably we'll go ahead and make a couple more harvests of the leaves that are for the most part intact and then just rip it all out. And here in like mid to late July is when I start my seeds inside for my fall garden. And kale will be one of the things that I grow a lot of again in the fall. Kale like brassicas, just the brassica family, um, they can handle temperatures that drop below freezing. Down to a pretty hard frost, they do okay without any cover or anything. And then if you can provide a little bit of cover, like some frost fabric, sometimes even just throwing a sheet over them over a cold night, uh, they can last even through colder temperatures. And I prefer just growing that stuff during the cool weather. Whereas right now I could fight all of those worms and bugs to try to keep them off of that kale. Uh, that kale is getting old. It's been in there since the very beginning of the spring, late winter. And so it's getting a little tougher. Um, its flavor is getting really potent. And the hotter that it gets, the more bitter that it gets. Whereas kale that's grown in the cold and it's like frost kissed, is super kind of sweet. It's so much better. And it's kind of the same thing with any sort of root vegetable or brassicas. To me, it just makes more sense to not try to fight them uh, to grow during a time that they don't thrive and instead just embrace the seasons where they grow really well. Here, this big old plant covered in pollinators is catnip. That's also a plant that's a couple years old. Here around the catnip, I have some very persistent weeds, but right in here, I have some jalapeno plants. They have not taken off with quite the same vigor as those banana pepper plant, but there's still time for them to thrive, so we'll see what happens. Here I have some dahlias, which um, have been here for a couple years as well. They're very, very beautiful. And this here is some squash called Total Eclipse. Oh, look at that sunflower. It's starting to get ahead, so those should be open pretty quickly. That's exciting. I was recently asked a question that I thought was a really good question and definitely worth addressing. Someone noted the fact that I'm growing more hybrids this year than I ever have before. I'm growing 
um, a couple of varieties of hybrid squash, F1 hybrid, and some F1 hybrid sunflowers. I think I have one variety of F1 hybrid okra and a couple of tomatoes. I'm doing a whole bed in my high tunnel to compare with a bed of an heirloom variety called climbing triple crop which is designed for high tunnel growth and then i have like my sun sugars and sun golds which are also hybrids that was a question that i got asked why why are you doing that you've always been an heirloom person you've always really uh, stood for heirlooms so why do you have so many hybrids in your garden this year i still definitely feel like heirlooms are what i want to grow primarily, and it still is what I'm growing primarily. The majority of what's in my garden are heirloom varieties. However, I love to experiment, and I love to learn, and I love to try new things. And for instance, like with squash, that's something that I've always really, really struggled growing because we do deal with a lot of squash bugs and powdery mildew and just different issues here, vine borers and stuff like that, that can be just absolutely super persistent once you get into the summer. And I've never had great lasting success with squash. And I thought, well, I wanna try some of these other varieties and see if they do any better. And it's just more a curiosity thing for me. I am definitely curious by nature and I can read a lot of different things and learn a lot of different things. But to me, experience is hands down the best teacher. And so I, I don't want to just dismiss things that I haven't done a lot of. And I think that there are a lot of misconceptions about hybrids although i love growing heirlooms because i love the stories behind them i love the history i love the incredible variety that you just don't see anywhere like you don't get it at the grocery store it, you get to taste and experience things you would otherwise never get to taste and experience if you don't grow them i love that but i have never felt like hybrids in and of themselves are bad things they're just crosses uh, they are not always complete unsustainable I mean like if you have a hybrid tomato you can save the seeds you just won't get the same tomato you'll still get a tomato though in many cases so sometimes you, you're not gonna get a great tomato and so it's really best to save open pollinated seeds but the idea that if you grow a hybrid variety that you're just like dooming your garden to unsustainability I don't think that that's really true so I'm definitely not like giving up on heirloom gardening by any means I think that making anything black and white and condemning anything like growing at F1 hybrids is bad I think that we really limit ourselves as gardeners whenever we do that and I want to experience the full spectrum of gardening and success at home and I also want to try all of these things so that I can share the information with you guys and so far I feel I feel okay about the hybrids that I've grown I really like the sunflowers the squash we've harvested has been really tasty I don't have any negative feelings about them other than the fact that if I want to grow that exact variety again, of course you have to repurchase the seeds uh, from somebody. That is a drawback, but it's not to me enough of a drawback to swear off of growing them. Here around the pavilion, I've got this Inferno coleus. This is all just kind of ornamental stuff. This is a lantana plant, which had almost entirely died. I need to cut off some of the dead, but it came back. I've got a couple of fig trees in pots and just some other ornamental things, some peppermint. Here are the Ozark Beauty strawberry in this green stock. This is their first year grown from bare roots we've already harvested. Probably at least a quart, maybe upwards of two of strawberries out of that, which is really cool for a first year. Some sunflowers I replanted because my goats ate the other one. This is an artichoke. A friend of mine gave me this little tiny artichoke plant last March. I planted it in a pot and it just barely grew. And then I transplanted it into the garden bed um, this spring. My goats ate it down to a nub when they got into the garden. And then it came back with a, just like a fierce passion to grow, which I'm really excited. Go arty. Uh, this is a coleus. I can't remember the name. Somebody help me out with this coleus. And honestly, the reason it's in the corner of this bed is genuinely because I picked the plant off, off up off a clearance rack. It looks like it was dying. I accidentally left it out of here, out here till it looked almost entirely dead. And I just stuck it in the corner of this bed because I didn't have a place for it, but I didn't want it to die. And it came back looking great. Plants are so resilient 
and truly I think that a lot of the people who consider themselves to have a black thumb they just give up too easy my mom is just like a, a gardener she just always has been and I would joke about how my mom's house was the rehab where sick plants could go and recover but my house was the hospice where they would go and die I killed everything I killed all the plants but truly what I've learned is that I just gave up too easy. And just like watching my mom, like when something is just looks sad and brown and dying, my mom is like, oh, I can save that. And I've learned to adopt that mindset. Like, like for instance, that lantana that I showed you, that thing looked completely dead. And I was like, yeah, we're just gonna give it some water and some sun and cut it back and just keep watering it and caring for it. And it came back. And so often that happens, this coleus. I mean, I, it was literally like, I looked at it and thought I should probably just put this in the dumpster. And I was like, yeah, I'm just gonna stick it in the ground and see what happens and now I have this beautiful plant. I mean, what's the worst is gonna happen? You stick it in the ground and it dies. If you put it in the dumpster, uh, same outcome. So you're not really losing much. Here's another big old basil looking good. The squash, which interestingly, same variety planted at the same time. They're doing better in this bed. That can always be for a number of reasons. Those on that side are shaded by those dahlias. So maybe that's why, I'm not really sure, but these are definitely looking good. Here I have some clematis clematis however you say it on this arch there's a couple varieties this one is a contest can't remember contest bouchard i'm not exactly sure what that one is and then i've got one called uh, john paul and a double blue i think there's a few different varieties of clematis on this arch and they don't look like just a whole lot right now but they're going to. And this is gonna be really, really pretty. It's just gonna take a little while to establish. During one moment of impatient weakness, whenever the clematis was taking a really long time, I actually threw some seeds down here for a blue butterfly pea to kind of just fill out the space while we wait because this will die with the frost, but the clematis will uh, come back next year. So that will, that's what that is. There's another one right there. So those will grow up filled us out a little bit this year and I also scattered zinnia seeds all in here so clearly I was like demanding that this be full and beautiful like oh you will please me with your full beauty <laughs> more seeds more plants I hope I don't regret that here's the other noodle bean trellis uh, growing and looking good and these are dragon tongue bush beans right here I'm really really liking how these beds are filling out right here I think they're looking really nice here are some gherkin cucumbers called Parisian pickling, which they keep falling over instead of going up. And I'm not fighting them just a whole lot because as you can see here, the cucamelons, the Mexican sour gherkins, have started to just come sideways and take over this space. And they are at just the right size for harvesting. We've been doing a lot of snacking on these. Mexican sour gherkins, also called cucamelons or mouse melons. Um, if you're looking for seeds for them, they might be under any of those names. Um, when they first start to grow to the right size, which is about right here, um, they're really tasty and they're kind of like mildly sour, but they really just taste like a really refreshing kind of lemony cucumber. If you don't like the texture things where things like pop in your mouth, you're not gonna dig these, but if you do, they might be just the thing for you. If you leave them on the vine, their skins get tougher and they get more sour. Wow, the pollinator action in this area is intense so this is holy basil it's actually volunteered here uh, the original seeds for these plants were from mi gardener uh, the original seeds for my cucamelons were from baker creek as well as the parisian pickling cucumbers and then back behind here are some cutting sunflowers that are sown real thick because those are going to be cut for the table and then down here i've got a bunch of beets and these all need to be pulled and put in the dehydrator all right so i'm gonna list off the tomato varieties that i can right now uh, several of my markers got buried with the plant uh, accidentally by my child and so some of these i don't know the varieties of and i won't until i see the color of the fruit some it's starting to be where i can guess based on the shape of the fruit but uh, i won't know for sure until they change so these are sun sugars right here these little ones starting to change are sweeties. I've got sun golds, as are these. I've got two plants of those. These, I'm not entirely sure, but I think these are Napa Chardonnay blush, and they're starting to look like they're turning yellow. So based on the shape, that's what I would guess. And I've got purple bumblebee next to those. A couple plants of those. Starting to get a little blush on that one. 
And you can see they're really stripy there from the beginning. This is a variety called Amy's Apricot Cherry. Um, a gentleman named Tom here locally that I met at a seed swap gave me those seeds. And I grew a couple plants of those. My cousin Amy comes over and she loves to get cherry tomatoes from the garden. So I grew the Amy's Apricot Cherry for her. These are blue gold berries. I actually do not have blueberries, which is one of my favorite varieties. I don't have them in my garden this year because I didn't have seeds. Here I have a mystery multiflora. I'm not 100% sure what this is, but at some point the fruit will set and change color. And I think I can probably guess at that point. This is also a mystery. We'll see when it changes. Here I've got about four plants of Brad's Atomic Grapes. And this is a, a tomato that really varies a lot in size. So you get a pretty good size difference on these. Some of them are a little on the large side. There are some back here that I think are starting to blush a little. The Brad's Atomic Grapes are Malia's tomato. That's her favorite one. We grew these. It was the year that Baker Creek first released the seeds from Wild Boar Farms and they just like took off in popularity and I grew them and the first year that I grew them I wasn't super crazy about them because at the time I only really liked really 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 sweet cherry tomatoes like yellows that were super sweet and the Brad's Atomic Grape was definitely like an interesting and kind of complex flavor and they did not just like wow me right off the bat but Malia loved them and she just loved the flavor of them. She loved the way they looked and she claimed those as her plant. I've grown her about four plants every year. She keeps them picked. Those are her tomatoes. She'll share them with us after a little while. We don't get them at the beginning. And I've learned to really like Brad's Atomic Grapes. They actually have a flavor to them and the it's the weirdest thing what it reminds me of. I don't know if this if anybody else can go, yeah, I've had that experience or you might just think I'm crazy. There's a flavor to them that reminds me of like really hoppy beer. Like that's the thing that it makes me think of. I don't know if it's like a, a yeasty flavor or like what the deal is, but there's something in Brad's Atomic Grape Tomato that triggers that to me. So there's, I don't know what the flavor profile is. I have no idea how that even works. I've never had another tomato make me think that. And every year in the off season, I'll think, that's crazy. Those tomatoes don't taste like that. And then every year I grow those tomatoes and taste them and I'm like, yes, they do. It reminds me, there's something in them that reminds me of beer. <laughs> so I don't know. <laughs> Please, can someone validate that? Can someone say, I see where you're coming from? Or just tell me I'm crazy so I can stop saying it. <laughs> Here I've got some sweet 100 starting to turn. I'm not picking any of these cherry tomatoes right now, even though there are a few that are ripe because Benjamin has asked me to let him pick them. So I am. Now this I planted late, so that's why the plant is so small. This is actually a variegated tomato called Splash of Cream. You can see that really pretty variegation on that leaf. Variegated tomatoes are a thing and uh, they do get variegated leaves. However, it's kind of a silly thing. When they grow in full sun, their variegation weakens. And so they end up not being super variegated leaves, but they're fruits will a lot of times still end up being really splashy and stripy. Uh, next year I want to try growing some variegated tomatoes in my high tunnel where the sun will be filtered from the shade cloth and maybe the variegation can stand out. Uh, those seeds are from P&W Seeds. I'll, I'll link all these seed companies in the description of this video. Um, but they're on Etsy and Instagram and she sent me those. This plant is a Berry's Crazy Cherry. Here I've got some open space where I had some big kale plants. Uh, here are some more sweet 100s, and I have no idea what that is. Let's take a quick look here. Check out this sunflower. It's taller than the pavilion. Here I've got some silver queen okras, more sunflowers there. This is a kakuzi uh, gourd, which these are just starting to set here. Oh, check that out. That one's pretty good size. So you actually are supposed to harvest these young and eat them like squash. And I don't know how young. Can somebody tell me? Do I need to pick this here pretty soon? I want to see how big it gets. Tall trailing nasturtiums. Uh, they're dying back, but I have not pulled them out because I want to harvest the seed pods. You can pickle nasturtium seed pods. They're sometimes called the poor man's caper. And I would like to do that. But I don't actually know how. I've got to figure out how. But I'll share that with you guys. And here on the end, I've got a little patch of zinnias. This is a lily bed, just random types of lilies. I've got kind of a half dead rosemary and some chives here. I need to do something with this bed. 
And then down here, I've got a handful of roses. I need to reweed this bed and mulch it, but what's in here is ginger, and you can see some shoots coming up here, but there's also a lot of weeds. I don't want them to have to compete with that. Here are some more silver slicer cucumbers. I unintentionally planted a lot of those. I think I got my tags mixed up because I thought I was planting something different, but I also have some Ann Cash Market cukes here. And I have quite a lot of open space. I got a massive thyme. The one I showed you at the beginning of the garden also looked like this before I cut it back and I'm hoping it recovers. And here throughout this, I've got some marigolds and basil and different com companion plants, but lots of open space. I have sowed, tried to sow so many melons on these trellises that have just not done well. Birds have gotten at them and stuff. And so I don't even remember what kind of melon that is. This is a Malabar spinach that came back and I just let it go here. And I'm gonna sow something else on this trellis as well. Here we've got some roselle, uh, volunteer okra back here. These came back and I let them, let them stay because there wasn't anything else going on. This is a ground cherry. Now this is a sad thing. I have a tomatillo here. I had two, but one was eaten by the goats and I've re-sowed them a couple of times and they just haven't done well. I need to get my hands on another tomatillo because there, there has to be another one for these to actually set their fruit. They have to cross pollinate. So otherwise this is gonna be just nothing. Here I've got curly leaf parsley waiting to make me a delicious chimichurri. These massive coral zinnias, these actually volunteered in my walkway and I just popped them up into the bed and they're thriving. More Malabar spinach, more purple basil. There's basil all over the place in case you haven't noticed. I did a bunch of basil starts in little trays and just literally one day came and just plugged them all over the garden. Just no, no discrepancy, just basil everywhere. Now these rows are very, very exciting to me because looking at the size of these tomatoes, we're gonna be eating these pretty soon. Again, don't know all the varieties and I'm just gonna go quickly. These are striped Germans. Look at that thing. It easily weighs over a pound already and it's not even ripe. Also striped German right here. Maybe, maybe, maybe. Just leaning a little bit towards blushing on those. Here are Costaludo Genovese. Uh, this doesn't have a label, but I'm thinking it's probably also Costaludo Genovese. These are Jersey Devils, which I have a couple plants of. Here's another one. This is one called Rose. This is also a rose. Uh, this sad little thing has no tag and also has no top. This got topped accidentally, so I don't know how well it's gonna do, but it has a cluster of fruit on there, so I just left it. That might be all that produces. This is a variety called Homestead, supposed to be pretty good for canning. These are pineapples. Starting to see a little bit of yellow spotting coming in on my plants, pretty typical of this time of year. More pineapples here. Uh, no tag here, no tag. Here is Mr. Stripey. This massive plant is hillbilly and they are pretty loaded and very, very tall. Hillbilly next to it, however, is not really thriving. This is called Floridad. Also starting to look like it's struggling a little bit. Here is a San Marzano. This has a few little fruits set on it. These are climbing triple crops which this is a control because I've got some of these going in the high tunnel. I wanted to see how they did comparatively outside. Uh, this is a mortgage lifter. Actually, this one is two. And then this is one called Homs. And there's a random volunteer ground cherry. This bed is lemon balm and mint and persistent weeds. I have so much lemon balm and mint dried in my house that I haven't harvested anything from this this year, but it just does what it wants. So this last tomato bed, all that's in this is tomatoes and then some random like nasturtiums and basils on the end. This is a variety called Eva's Purple Ball. And I, I saw these at the uh, Baker Creek Festival last year and wanted to grow them because they were all so uniform that I thought they would be fantastic for canning. Okay, not seeing tags on these. This is the row where I had the most help from Benjamin. So this is gonna have the most mystery tomatoes. Um, but they're big, <laughs> they're big mysteries. So I think these are actually Dr. Witchies. I'll know when they turn. They look like them. That's what Dr. Witchies look like. And I know that they were down towards this end of this row. So I'm pretty sure that's what that is. And there's like four plants that are identical. So my guess is yes, that's what that is. This is vintage wine. 
which is a really, really pretty streaky fluted fruit. I'm not sure here what we got going on. There's no tag, but this is persimmon next to it. These are black beauties from Wild Boar Farm. Now they get their purple first and then they get their red afterwards. So when the bottom part starts turning and they start softening up, they're ripe. Just because they're getting purple doesn't mean anything. And I've got a few of those. These are some Abe Lincolns. Again, a control because I'm growing these in the greenhouse. These are Paul Robesons, all four of these fruit plants. And they're starting to set fruits. I planted these significantly after the others, a few weeks after. I just tied these up the day before yesterday and they're already falling over. These are pineapples and none of these have tags. So we'll just have to wait and see. I'm pretty sure this one down here on the end is Cherokee purple, even though it doesn't have a tag. So that's all the varieties in the front garden. And now we're gonna go to the back and I'm just gonna point out the varieties that are back there really quickly. I can feel the rain coming in. So we're gonna have to, I would say cut this short, but there's nothing short about this. We just harvested these beds early this morning. So there's not just a ton of fruit to show you, but I will show you a little bit of what we have and just tell you, I've got this whole row of okra which down here on the end is burgundy. And there are a few of these to pick. I've also got a variety called emerald in here and Clemson spineless and a little bit of Texas Hill Country down at the end. Now the summer squash row is wild and the winter squash row is getting pretty wild. This is probably the last garden tour you're gonna see these plants on because they're it's time for them to come out. They're, they're done. This is a winter squash, which I'm not sure what it is, but what I planted, I don't think was supposed to look like that. This, I'm not really sure what's going on here. I do have some little winter squash called honey nut, which are looking really lovely. I also have some New England pie pumpkins. And the summer squash this year, I did the hybrid uh, sunburst, as well as some patty pans, and just some plain prolific yellow crooknecks and some zucchini. My purpose with the squash was just to try. I've had such poor luck with squash in the past that I went with the varieties that most people have the most success with. And that was more of the common ones, like the early prolific crooknecks and the, the patty pan summer squash and those F1 hybrids, the sunburst. And I've had pretty good luck. I mean, we've harvested a lot of squash already. However, the squash bugs are coming out really hard. I've been like trying to spray some different organic pesticides and stuff on these plants, but there are so many plants. It's such a jungle. It's really hard to get all up in there. I've done a lot of pruning. But uh, one thing that I think I may have to just accept here is that the late spring and early summer is going to be really heavy squash and then I can replant them and then I always have success with fall. Like I, we, we don't get freezing until like the end of October and the early November. So, so if I replant these in August, I can usually start harvesting again by late September, early October. And usually there's no squash bugs at that point. Sometimes it's just learning again what time of year things are going to work best for you. Here I have sweet potatoes called Beauregard, most of them. I have a couple other varieties of like red sweet potatoes that my friends at Deep South Homestead sent me. I've got a bed of Jerusalem artichokes back here. And one last area that has some red fingerling potatoes. Then here I have what are called like sherbet watermelons. There's one right there. See that guy peeping out? And over here, sugar baby watermelons, which I accidentally broke one off yesterday. It was not ready, so that was sad. Here are the Pro Cut Cutting Sunflowers. And here on the ground, also dealing with powdery mildew, but here's one pumpkins. And that one's starting to turn, as you can tell. And there are quite a few in the ground here. And hopefully this plant can stay alive long enough to ripen these. Here we have a squash called Sweet Meat. And down here, Really traditional, great winter storage squash, butternuts. And just in this little area right now, I think I've probably got about 20 of these uh, growing. Honestly, with as far as they're sprawling out, we may have something more like 30. They're just all over the place. Here are some field peas right in the middle. And then over on this side, some more yellow zinnias. Actually, these are a, these are a variety. I don't know what they're actually called. Uh, I've always called them peppermint. 
but I don't know if that's actually right. But they come in different colors and they have streaks on them. And then down, all down here, these are all melons. Mostly watermelons of varying variety. I actually don't know the melon varieties off the top of my head and it's so overgrown that there's no way I can find the tags. I'll probably have to go back to the video when I planted this, but I'm pretty sure there's Charleston Gray, Desert King, I think Orange Glow, Moon and Stars, which you can see that, which you can see that right there. Look at that foliage, pretty spots on the melons. There's another melon. They're all in here. And then down here is a really large cantaloupe variety. And these are supposed to get really big. That was actually one of the only things that Jeremiah picked to put in the garden. You coming in? Bear doesn't like to come in the high tunnel because he doesn't like it when he gets trapped in here and it's too hot. Can't blame him. Here on this side, I've got mostly just regular hot peppers like jalapenos, some more hot banana peppers, and cayennes. So these are the cayennes I'm going to use for chili powder. That's what all these are. Here I have an eggplant variety called Edern Striped and one called Antigua. Here are pineapple ground cherries uh, planted at two different times. You can see some are much smaller, but they'll take off and catch up. These are not apenos and habanadas, which are two peppers like a jalapeno and a habanero, but they don't have heat. This is a weed called bindweed. It's actually wild morning glory and it will wreak havoc on your garden if you ever see it pull it out. Here on the inner more, not apenos, which I wanted to grow a lot of because we love stuffing peppers and stuff, but I have some kids that really don't like spicy, so I think that'll be really good. I also wanted to pickle them, make pickled not apenos so you could do like pepper slices on nachos or chili or whatever without it being super spicy. The peppers on this side, oh, there are so many varieties right here. I can tell you like what is mostly here. Some of these, like I have the, I know what's here, but they're not marked. And when they change colors, I'll know what they are. But some I know, like this is a sweet pepper called Gypsy. I ended up buying more started peppers this year because I hadn't planned on planting this many because when I started my seeds, I didn't know I was going to have the high tunnel. And so I wanted to grow a lot of peppers in the high tunnel. So I had to buy plants. This is a candy cane, variegated sweet pepper, really beautiful fruit. Back on the back here are poblanos, which I will let ripen and then dry for chili powder. I've got a few varieties of bell peppers. I grew quite a few bell peppers, which I want to be able to eat fresh and then also dice and freeze those for using in like jambalaya and stuff over the winter and then scrambles. I have a lot of chilies called mirasols, which grow up. Another popular drying chili. And then I have some called chilaca and pasilla bajillo. Pasilla Bajillo, I don't know. Um, I think I'm saying that right. Uh, and they are also, those are very popular drying peppers and that's what quite a few of these are. Oh, time to get pepper supports. That's what tells me when they start falling over, I'm like, oh, gotta do something about it. Here's another variegated pepper called fish pepper. See, that's really pretty. Got a few of those here. I have Tabascos along the backside here. These are shishitos, which we're getting down here towards the end where some of my peppers struggled because the water coming in the high tunnel and some of them died from overwatering, but they look good now. These are sugar ash peaches. That's what I like to make hot sauce out of is the sugar ash peach. These are just like a classic eggplant, just a big purple eggplant. I'll be making my eggplant parmesan and my creamed eggplant. Back here are Anaheim's which is what I make diced chilies, like diced green chilies, like what you buy at the store. I use Anaheim's for that. And some more jalapenos down here because apparently I was feeling that at pepper buying time. I've got lots of jalapenos. All of these are, and I've got some empty space. Now lastly, the high tunnel tomato varieties. This is pretty easy because a lot of these are the same. This whole bed is my hybrid bed. Almost all of these are Jet Stars and Better Boys. Now they are ahead of the rest of the greenhouse uh, tomatoes, not surprising being hybrids. A lot of times they're bred to grow faster, so we're really seeing that. We'll probably harvest these first. This row is the only row that's super mixed up. And here I have Amish Paste, Bonnie Best. I have a few Opalkas, Arkansas Travelers. That's what's all down this row. 
this entire bed is climbing triple crop, which I'm comparing the yield of the heirloom versus the hybrid here. This whole side, uh, well, about two thirds of this side is Dr. Witchy's, and then the bottom third is Thornburn's Terracotta. The front side here is Blue Beauty. The other side is Black Beauty. And I have a few random ones down here on the end. Kellogg's Breakfast, a couple of Black Brandy Wines, Great Whites, uh, one called a Triple Cop Tree that someone sent me. I was just experimenting. And on the other side of this is all Abe Lincoln's on this end, past the Black Beauties. Oh, I was concerned that my Blue and Black Beauties weren't gonna get blue. <laughs> in the high tunnel because the filtered sun. Someone actually sent me a pictures of theirs grown under shade cloth and they were very dark and I was happy to see it, but I see some color coming in on those. Now that my friends is every variety growing in my vegetable gardens. Now what I did not cover today are the berries, which we do have varieties of blueberries, blackberries, and raspberries. We also have some things called gooseberries and kiwi berries, and they are planted in, we have a couple of little random beds along the fence lines that don't have animals on the other side of them. Um, but that's a Jeremiah's baby. I cannot tell you what those are, I don't know. Um, they're all very new, so they haven't started really fruiting yet, but we got a bunch of that stuff from Stark Brothers this year. Uh, one thing I did not show you either was my pool of strawberries over on the other side of my greenhouse. So I don't know what variety those are. They were sent to me by a viewer. We do have a big pear tree uh, next door that are just green pears that was here whenever we moved here. And we have plans of possibly planting some dwarf fruit trees up front, but we just haven't done that yet. But I realized in asking a couple weeks ago what I should grow, a lot of people made suggestions that we actually are growing, but I realized that I had not gone through and just pointed and said everything that was growing in the garden. So now I have. We'll go into more harvesting and talking about individual varieties again next week on the tour. Thank you guys for hanging out with me today. We beat the rain. It's actually starting to sprinkle a little bit out there. So uh, we just barely got this video covered. Thank you again. I bless you until next time.